So, Spina, when did you first hear about carbon capture and storage, would you say? Uh, well, actually a long time ago, already when I was doing my PhD, I was doing some, some energy modeling and CCS was definitely already a, a topic back then. Um, then I did for a while, I, I was more into to land use, land use modeling. And, uh, but then actually uh, with, um, yeah, with further delays in climate change mitigation and um, then also uh, uh, more and more ambitious targets, uh, it's, it's coming back <laughs> full steam. So uh, it played, as I will show in the, in the talk, it played quite a, quite a big role uh, in, my, in my work for the IPCC in the past years as well. And um, obviously you're in, in Germany, I mean, how, maybe you're going to say it, but how, how, you think people generally were aware of CCS in Germany? When you were, or was it a actually? I did my PhD. Subject? I did my PhD actually in the Netherlands. So. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but you know that uh, with respect to Germany, the the CCS question has been a difficult one, right? It's, I mean, there's been research into it, but uh, there's also been quite a lot of uh, resistance and actually uh, a quasi moratorium on what 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 had been going on before, but. Um, if we're looking into the future, I'm tentatively a little bit more optimistic. I mean, last year, CCS was again sort of elevated uh, to the agenda for industry, but also in, in the context of, of carbon dioxide removal. But uh, I, I feel the theme is only now entering uh, the debate again. And, uh, I'm sorry, I should have asked, what, what was your sort of first degree? My, my PhD was in economics, yeah. And, and your first your degree before that? I, I did a master's also in economics, economics. also in the Netherlands, yeah. Okay, so uh, yes, that's very interesting. So, economics, so, so then what, what made you get into climate from economics? Why didn't you get a good paying job? Actually, I was, I was myself, finance, yeah, I was actually myself interested uh, from the beginning in, in all issues related to sustainability, but specifically climate change. And that's why I already went into that direction with my with my PhD thesis. But I, I was a little bit the odd one out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I guess so. And I mean, my impression, and it's only an impression, is that there's actually very few um, ab initio economists doing energy economics. There's a lot of people who've got into energy economics who did a, another degree. Would you would you say that's true? And do you, you notice any difference? Yeah, I mean, it might have to do with the uh, career path in economics usually being quite different, right? It's not yeah. where you excel in with interdisciplinary publications <laughs> yeah. and so on. So that that's maybe also what's partially partially behind uh, the fact that you usually see it the other way around. So yeah, I guess yeah. it's it's related yeah. more more to my my personal motivation. But actually, I'm sitting at the at the MCC where we have lots of uh, economists that work on on climate change and the economics okay. of climate change as well. So uh, I feel very much at home here. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's where, that's where all the economists in climate change go then. I mean, I I, I suppose what, what, just what would you say that you and other economists bring to climate change? Um, yeah, usually what people yeah, expect when I say I'm an economist, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm only sort of like looking at the, oh, we have another guest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then we, uh, th that I'm only looking at the costs. Uh, but I would say that that basically all of, like me, my, myself, and, and, and all of the other economists I know that got into the topic um, also have, have a much broader uh, uh, entry into, into the um, into the topic. I think uh, we, we can uh, bring a little bit more the systems view from, from an economic um, uh, perspective. And I think right now is actually a time where this becomes very evident, right? Uh, Post-corona, um, a lot of people are looking to economists that also um, know about climate change to think about how could we actually design recovery pa packages so that we don't make a step backwards when it comes to, mm -hmm. to climate change mitigation. So I think, yes, we have something to contribute and uh, we'll continue to do so. Yeah, okay.
Right, well, very good. Uh, particularly if you're, uh, you know, some, someone who spends the money, if we can get it, then uh, I think economists who are contributing to post-COVID stimulus packages that may end up putting a little bit of money to CCS are, are very important people. So, <laughs> very good. Okay. Um, the floor is yours, Sabine. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Yes, uh, so, so thank you, John, for this uh, unusual but very nice introduction. And uh, also thank you for inviting me. I feel actually quite honored to inaugurate uh, the uh, UK CCSRC Autumn Web Series with a rather broad talk where I think a lot of what will still follow uh, will nicely fit in. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, carbon dioxide removal, so CDR in global pathways to, to net zero. And um, I will draw uh, very much on um, my work for the IPCC in the past years, specifically the um, special report um, uh, on global warming of uh, 1.5 degrees C. And uh, when I had a look at the uh, spring series, uh, I actually saw that you already had um, authors of uh, that report speaking. So I can actually uh, save a lot of time because you've already been exposed uh, to all the background knowledge about the carbon budget and so on by um, uh, colleagues uh, such as um, Miles Allen. And I can immediately dive into why CCS is really important um, in uh, global uh, pathways uh, to net zero by looking at this uh, figure I brought from the summary for policymakers of the special report. So um, we actually uh, plot here all the pathways that were assessed in the report, the emissions until uh, 2100. And even though you see that they um, that there is quite a quite a bunch of them, all of them um, exhibit two. Uh, main characteristics. So uh, the first characteristic is that you see an immediate turnaround in emissions if you want to reach 1.5 degrees and then very rapid and deep emissions reductions in a short and medium run to reach net zero on average around 2050. Just to put that a little bit into perspective, what, what kind of challenge that is, um, I have put those uh, red lines in here in the next slide. And um, the upper red line shows uh, where we would end up if um, all of the country pledges that were made um, in the frame of the Paris Agreement were met to 100%. And um, that would leave us with something in excess of 50 gigatons CO2 per year, the upper red line, as I said. And as you see, that's not even on our graph. So we're far removed from any chance to reach 1.5 degrees, even if we fully live up to the promises that we've made um, for 2030. Uh, on average, we would actually need to be um, somewhere around half of this, right? That's, that's about 25 gigatons CO2 per year. So then coming to the second characteristic that I announced, I put this other red line in here to illustrate that all of those pathways um, that we looked at in the report actually dive under the zero line. That means all of them have net negative emissions, withdraw more CO2 from the atmosphere than they're releasing back to it um, for two purposes, either because we want to offset residual positive emissions, for instance, from sectors that are difficult to decarbonize in the short run, but also to return from overshoot. So if we exceed our carbon budget, emit more than we're allowed to in order to keep our chances to reach 1.5 degrees open and actually exceed 1.5 degrees warming during the century, then we need to withdraw CO2 in order to pull temperatures back to um, an increase of uh, 1.5 degrees C. And um, interestingly, um, during the process of the report, so a lot of delegations actually said, these are not p pathways that, that exhibit large overshoot and where we have much higher temperatures during the century, these don't qualify for us as 1.5 degree pathways. So that's actually also why you see here um, those pathways with higher overshoot um, shaded in gray. And a lot of what I will be saying in, uh, in what follows um, is actually referring to those bluish pathways, those that don't have a lot of overshoot or no overshoot at all. Um, the next slide actually shows um, 
a, a graphic that's already a little bit older. So that's a typical two degree pathway. Pulled that from the UN um, emissions gap report from 2017. And um, what I want to bring across here is very much related to those two purposes of using negative emissions, uh, because what you normally only see is this red line, so the net emissions and how they dive under the zero line. And then you actually see those um, uh, net negative GHG emissions at the end of the century here. That's also why the debate in my perception has not been um, so big uh, because you 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 always had the feeling oh this is something that happens at the end of the century however what this masks is that you're also using co2 uh, to removal to offset um, these residual positive emissions so what is shaded here in light blue as gross negative co2 emissions and these are ramped up relatively early already for a for a two degree pathway here already in the first half of the century so it's not like the challenge hasn't been there for a, for a while and uh, that that 1.5 degree totally changes changes things um, this has actually been uh, um, an issue already for two degree pathways now i said uh, in the beginning that uh, we see quite a bunch of pathways were there that could be assessed to reach 1.5 degrees global warming um, but some of them exhibit quite different trajectories. So here I um, highlight two scenarios. Um, the first one, scenario one, is actually one where we see negative emissions mostly to offset residual positive emissions and relatively little carbon dioxide removal um, uh, that, that actually leads to net negative emissions. So we dive only very to a very small extent under the zero line here. And we have very, very drastic immediate emissions reduction. It's almost like a vertical fall. Um, in scenario two, we actually see more flexibility. We have greater positive emissions um, in the short and medium run, but then as a result, also larger carbon dioxide removal and higher overshoot before temperature then uh, temperature increase then declines to something between 1.3 and 1.4 degrees C at the end of the century. Still, these emissions reductions, I don't want to sort of say that this is a piece of cake. They are drastic, they're quick. So um, the next two decades will still face quite a challenge. And um, maybe to also put it a little bit into perspective, because in the introduction, we were talking a little bit about the, the Corona crisis and uh, the lockdown um, and the, the, the basically the fall in economic activity that we've been seeing associated with that first um, estimations that that project how much that has saved us in 2020 are something between, yeah, I think three and, and, and seven um, percent um, for for 2020, if you assume that the economy economies uh, pick up um, now after after the lockdown again. So this is something where we actually see the challenge if we talk about demand side reductions, right? I mean, if we think about okay, on average, this is maybe five percent. These are five percent that we have really dearly paid for, and this is a situation that we would need to see. Um, for the next 10 years in order to get um, somewhere close to, um, to, the, to the reductions uh, that would put us on, on a 1.5 degree pathway, just to give a little bit of, a, of an idea what, what these drastic emission reductions mean. Um, another way to, to illustrate the challenge that we're talking about is to look at exactly what I've been mentioning before, the CO2 that we will have difficulties getting rid of in the in the um, short and medium run. So here's a figure from, from Tong et al. Um, 2019 that shows um, uh, emissions that we're sort of committed to because existing infrastructure cannot be phased out from one day to the other. And um, there is a lot of uh, proposed energy infrastructure also in the pipeline. So they were trying to project um, what portion that would then um, consume of the carbon budget. And again, I have put in red lines to highlight what happens mid-century because mid-century mid we just um, saw we have to be 
um, at net zero. And if we look at um, the annual CO2 emissions here, we're far from net zero. We're still almost at 10 gigatons uh, CO2 per year, um, even for the stuff that's that's existing, and then um, even um, higher when we also take into account what's already being in the pipeline. And the authors of that article concluded that the committed emissions from existing proposed energy infrastructure would consume the entire remaining carbon budget um, for global warming of uh, 1.5 degrees with a probability of 50 to 66 percent. So that is another way to really underline what kind of challenge we're faced with here. Now I don't have to explain to people in this audience how, um, how, how CCS works, but just to highlight um, that the um, technology that underlies most of the carbon removal that we've seen in the graph that I've shown you before, um, that is typically still bioenergy with CCS. So whereas for the climate we withdraw fossil fuels from um, geological reservoirs, combust them and then add CO2 to the atmosphere, um, thereby generating climate change, then if you do bioenergy, you sequester the, addition, uh, the CO2 in the additionally grown biomass, but then when you transform it into energy, um, you um, let it escape again into the atmosphere. If you do CCS, um, then uh, you don't let the CO2 escape to the atmosphere. Only if you combine the two, then you actually withdraw CO2 from the atmosphere. So this is really the technology um, that conceptually underlies uh, these big removals that we've seen in the pathways before, even though integrated assessment models have increasingly teamed up um, with land use models now as well, or um, uh, incorporated land use modules of their own in order to also have um, the possibility to sequester CO2 through large, through large scale afforestation typically. So I don't want to say much more about this because uh, you are the technology experts. So let me focus more on the role that this plays in these pathways. Um, there's actually very few pathways that manage to uh, keep uh, 1.5 degrees warming um, at the end of the century without BECs, but there are a couple of them. This is actually new in the 1.5 degree report. The scenario space is much wider now because there are a couple of scenarios that I have particularly tried on purpose to avoid um, BECs. Um, however, these typically require radical demand side emissions reductions and also carbon neutral alternatives to liquids and gases that do not rely on, on biomass. So um, we've already talked about uh, how uh, drastic uh, the demand side reductions um, will have to be. So I'm not going to talk further about this, but I think it's also good that the scenario space is widened so that we can have a discussion about this and so that we can inform the policy process on the full spectrum rather than having only those pathways that feature large removals uh, with BACs when a lot of delegations, I said that before, even said, okay, these are not even uh, valid 1.5 degree pathways to us. Um, I think for such an audience, it's also um, important to talk not only about BECs, but also to, to, to keep the perspective um, to also uh, talk about fossil CCS and therefore um, the uh, accumulated fossil and biogenic uh, CO2 stored by mid-century is something between zero and 460 gigaton CO2 in those pathways, zero for those few, very few pathways that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. And of that, um, uh, BEX uh, is only a portion, but a significant portion. Um, we see BEX deployment in those uh, bluish pathways I've shown before, those with limited or no overshoot of up to 1, 8 and 16 gigaton CO2 in 2030, 50 and 2100, respectively. That gives you an idea also of the challenge that uh, we face in terms of scaling these technologies up. And I'll get back to that um, in a minute. Um, what I also want to touch on is that in the report, we also systematically assess the literature that, um, that looks at sort of the bottom up estimates of, of BECs and that also critically uh, looks at um, sustainability factors. So where do we put the, this additionally grown biomass? What do we fertilize it with? Um, 
what about land use competition and so on. And um, they often find that these uh, gigaton scale uh, removals uh, that we see in the scenarios are at odds with what's uh, deemed uh, sustainable in this more yeah, bottom up literature. Um, just to give you a couple of uh, numbers also from what, uh, because I, I flagged land use competition, land use change as one of the big concerns. And I think it's also one of the concerns that's uh, featuring still quite highly in the and quite prominently in the debate. So the land use change associated with those pathways, um, I, I pulled that from chapter two of the report. And yes, we see that um, uh, we have uh, quite a, a lot of. Um, uh, additional uh, landmass dedicated to growing energy crops um, and we see that this mostly goes at the expense of uh, pastures of land uh, where we currently see food and feed crops um, but what we also see is what I was alluding to before that a lot of models are trying to sequester more CO2 by expanding forest areas so this is something that we see reflected here so again these these in red are the, the low stabilization pathways that we would typically refer to to discuss the 1.5 degree target. Now, um, I have to hurry up a little bit to get to the interesting uh, part. Um, I said that we systematically looked at the literature on side effects, sustainability risks, and so on. Um, and uh, the overarching majority um, of the BACS literature that looks at, at these interaction effects looks at negative side effects. So I already mentioned um, uh, land use competition, which is um, associated with um, risks for biodiversity, but also food security, because we will also need land in order to uh, grow um, uh, food crops and, and to, um, to have, have pasture for, for, um, uh, for, for, for increasing food supply for a growing um, world population. And if we have looked at what I've showing, been showing you before, if we see that these um, areas are to be reduced, then of course uh, it's not a surprise that a lot of the literature has focused on the concerns around food security. And there's also um, literature around um, <clears throat> the um, uh, around uh, the emissions that would come forth from fertilizing, from uh, transforming um, the biomass, into uh, into energy and so on. So um, this is not to say that there couldn't also be positive interaction effects, but the literature has really featured the, the risks and most of the sustainability risks that come uh, with scaling up backs. Uh, I also want to, to highlight that um, if we look at pathways that try to take out CCS, in order to avoid these, these high tax rates. Um, they don't typically solve this, this land competition issue because here what we see is that um, without CCS, um, by, so the, the red ones, we see that uh, bioenergy use um, uh, is, is largely unchanged or even increases because bioenergy is a very versatile technology. And if we cannot have CCS, uh, to, to decarbonize certain sectors, then bioenergy moves in at other spots, for, for example, in the transport sector, where then more biofuels are used. So um, it is not always as easy as, as excluding one technology, um, especially when you're talking about bioenergy. Just to give you an overview of the other technologies and practices that we've also looked at in the report, um, we've uh, looked uh, at the ones uh, at the lower end of the cost spectrum, which are often in the debate now called natural climate solutions, afforestation, reforestation, restoration, soil carbon sequestration with quite significant potentials and low costs. But um, by these dashed lines, we also want to highlight that there are issues um, pertaining to permanence um, and um, and saturation. Um, we've talked about BEX, uh, that which is sort of in the middle here, along with enhancing natural weathering processes. And then um, at the top of the, the graph, so at the outer 
um, cost spectrum, something that, that many of you are very familiar with, um, direct air carbon capture and storage, which features very high on the cost axis here. But please also note that um, when we did this in uh, 2018, it was published. So the literature extends uh, to 2017. So this doesn't take into account the progress that has already been made in the, in the past few years. Now, I already said something about the um, challenge uh, that we um, see in the scenarios um, to upscale um, CDR. So the gross negative emissions that you see here for a typical two degree uh, scenario uh, would have to, to rise quite significantly, again, underlining how quickly we would have to do this. Um, and uh, when, we, when we did the systematic literature review, on uh, what we actually know about upscaling. So we looked at what the different articles are associated with in terms of innovation stage. There is actually quite some knowledge around research and development and also on, on other supply um, factors. But then if you really look at the demand factors, so what kind of niche markets are there um, to get the, the, the CDR um, deployed? What about demand pool, public acceptance? We see very little research actually uh, very little publications that could inform uh, the policy process. So much more work uh, is needed here and uh, probably we're going to see much more work also in this area in this uh, web series. Also, and this is the second part of, uh, of my lecture that I hope will entice quite some debate, this is no longer just an academic debate, right? Um, we've been seeing uh, regions, uh, countries, even companies to pledge um, 2050 or even earlier carbon neutrality and um, have corresponding legislation um, associated with this. The UK has been at the forefront here and uh, a country that I have been visiting last year that pledged um, 20, by 2045 carbon neutrality and then net negative emissions thereafter after is Sweden. And I believe that in the future, we will have to look much more closely at the country context in order to unearth the different opportunities and also to map out our roads to carbon neutrality. So in order to, so, um, at, at, at higher granularity, translate those uh, challenges and requirements that I've shown in the first half of the lecture that come from the global pathways to the national context. Um, and interestingly, in Sweden, we actually see uh, something else emerging where we have, uh, where, whereas I have uh, emphasized in the first half of the lecture that there's been so much um, uh, opposition against BEX, uh, so much highlighting of the, um, of the uh, negative side effects of deploying C um, uh, CCS and BEX in particular, um, in Sweden, we actually see a quite different picture. So let me show as a first step um, CCS as, as a sort of uh, Swedish case example. And here what you see is a mapping of um, all the point sources of CO2, which is what you should typically start with when you talk about CCS and then by extension BEX. So on the left hand side, you actually see all the smaller installations. Um, and uh, the smaller CO2 point sources between 100 and 500 kilotons. And on the right hand side, you see the, um, the larger ones that exceed 500 uh, kilotons CO2. And um, you typically see that um, both of them, but typically the, the larger ones, are located at the coastline, which is already addressing one big discussion point that we also met quite a bit in the uh, IPCC context, and that is about the storage, right? What about all those countries that have not uh, invested into ramping up their storage infrastructure? And, and Sweden is one of those countries. So being on the, on the coastline, there is actually the, the, the possibility to transport the CO2 by ship. And um, as I could actually uh, witness myself when I uh, visited the first, uh, the inauguration of the first Swedish BEX plant by Stockholm Exegy at the end of last year, this is actually really what they plan to do. They plan to transport by ship and sign up for the Northern Lights project so that 
um, there would be Norwegian storage to the locally um, uh, captured uh, CO2. So um, if we now um, dive a little bit more deeply into the right hand side of the map and look at um, those larger industrial point sources, um, these are 27 and um, these are not only fossil um, plants. So a lot of the, the CO2 that comes out of these uh, point sources is biogenic because Sweden actually has um, its own um, sustainable biomass supply, um, having a very mature forestry industry and uh, using a lot of biomass already anyway. So this is actually a quite nice entry point towards adding uh, CCS and thereby achieving negative emissions um, as a result. So in the following slide, um, you actually see a marginal abatement cost curve. Um, both for uh, fossil CCS and BECS, and the biogenic emissions here are highlighted in, uh, in green so that you can actually um, distinguish the two. But what I want to show you here with is that if you look at the costs and then um, remember that Sweden is actually one of the countries that already does have a quite high um, price on CO2, somewhere around 100 uh, euros per ton of CO2, then um, you would see that a lot of this uh, makes actually quite a lot of sense uh, economically even already. And then if you try to put that into perspective at national scale, then you see that, um, that what you could remove here corresponds to more than half of the total emissions uh, in Sweden, and that counts all sectors. So by sort of uh, mapping out what's possible uh, with domestic supply, um, you can already get a get a get a long way, and um, interestingly, Sweden also had their own public inquiry following up from um, their uh, uh, legislation around uh, the 2045 uh, net neutrality goal, and then going net negative thereafter, where they were actually looking into um, how they could. Um, ramp um, CDR up and BEX actually features as uh, one of the possibilities in there and uh, what is also nice is that they are already trying to map that onto possible uh, policies um, taking into account existing policies but also realizing that um, as you go net negative you're sort of in a situation where you're providing a public good, right? The, the, the carbon removal. And um, this you will have to, to pay for somehow. And if you're at net, net zero before, then of course you don't have any proceeds or revenues anymore from taxing, taxing fossil fuels. So in that case, um, you would have to um, uh, come up with a solution for, for paying for those uh, for this CO2. And I know that uh, in, the, in the spring series, um, there was already, um, a discussion around the um, the uh, suggestion um, that all fossil um, fuels sort of pay their uh, yeah that that basically taxing one um, ton of, of fossil CO two could pay for the removal um, of uh, of its own um, uh, CO two footprint, but. Um, as you go net negative, of course, you would need something else. And the Swedes are actually thinking about uh, reverse uh, auctions in order to uh, provide incentives to um, withdraw the CO2. So um, this is, of course, um, nothing binding and it's just a public inquiry now. But I think it's very nice to show how nations are now started, starting to map out their own roadmaps. And um, I know that a lot has been going on in, in the UK context as well, but I on purpose chose another country so that people could come in also in the discussion and we would have um, a little bit more um, to exchange um, uh, also in terms of lessons learned that could maybe transfer to other countries or not. And I'm very uh, excited to hear what uh, people think about um, technologies, practices, policies, bottlenecks, barriers, enablers of different CDR strategies um, in their respective countries. 
But before closing and actually going to the discussion, let me leave you with a couple of takeaway messages because first half of the lecture is now some time uh, past now. Uh, so I hope what with the first part I was able to show was that reaching net zero is really a necessary condition for reaching the Paris climate goals. Otherwise, we will actually not be able to make it. So with the pledges we currently have, it's, it's not um, possible. And what we were in, in the introduction uh, with John already discussing, um, CCS will have to play a role in this and it's good to see that CCS is also getting back into the debate. Carbon removal um, will play a role as well, especially if we further delay um, climate change mitigation and ramping up our emission reductions ambitions, but it cannot substitute for radical and swift emissions reduction. So even this scenario too I was showing in the beginning, um, calls for very radical and swift emissions reduction. So these will already be challenging, um, even though they already rely on carbon removal later on. Interestingly, I think that which pathway will be ultimately chosen, including how much CO2 we want to remove and how we want to do that, how much do we want to rely on CCS? How much do we want to prop that up with more natural climate solutions, as they are called these days? And I'm sure they will be called something else soon <laughs> again. But there is definitely a debate around how such a portfolio would look like. And this will also be a societal choice. Which kind of risks do we think we can contain? Um, and then we also have to think, of course, of economic risks when we exclude certain technologies, as I hopefully also was able to demonstrate backs that I've been focusing quite a bit here, um, and especially in my sort of uh, Swedish case study, faces a number of sustainability constraints. If we look at um, the literature that we surveyed in the um, IPCC report, especially at a double digit gigaton scale of, of, of some of the 1.5 degree pathways, I think everybody um, agrees that uh, this is something where we won't be able to avoid these sustainability risks. But I hope with the second part, I was also able to, to show that it could be an important entry point into carbon removal for countries like Sweden and maybe the UK. So I think what has sunken in quite a bit now is that um, carbon removal is needed as we go forth. But we need to step forth from an academic debate and look at implementation now. And um, we also need to, to, to close quite a, a gap in terms of reach the research when it comes to implementation, of course, as I've shown. Um, but we also need to move forth um, in, in, in the dialogue and really try to map out for countries how different futures could look like incorporating um, CCS and carbon dioxide removal um, by extension. So with that, I want to finally close and hope we can have a, have a lively discussion around those topics. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Sabine. So just a reminder to people to um, either chip in or, or put something in the chat uh, if you want to ask a question. You don't necessarily need to put your full question in the chat if you just uh, you know, say, just let yourself be known. Um, but Sabine, I, I've I actually had a had an economist, heard an economist um, fairly recently talking at some length about carbon dioxide removal. And um, the message was basically, come on, don't be silly, this is this is got you've got to be able to do this more cheaply somewhere else than the UK. So the economically efficient way of, of getting carbon dioxide removal, as with all sorts of other things, is to import it from somewhere where it can be done cheaply, uh, maybe Sweden. But, but I think actually the American Midwest is probably the, the big place where you might, you might do things. I mean, as an economist, what's your thought about that? Because you kind of implied that you expect to see CDR within national boundaries, but you know, we don't expect to see all fossil yes. fuel produced within national boundaries anymore or anything else, really. Yes, that's a very good question. And, and maybe I should also say that part of the inquiry also sort of showed that part of the um, 
Swedish target would also be actually filled by something called international uh, credits or offsets. So there is definitely a space uh, within Sweden for that as well. And I didn't imply to say that everything had to be done uh, within uh, within limits, uh, within national boundaries. But I, I was what, what I wanted to to stress more is that if we don't start to to think about how this could nationally look like, how we could map out and and, and what actually could be a resilient that we would then sort of import from abroad, then we're no, getting nowhere near where we can actually have a discussion about how we can implement it. That, that's first and foremost uh, the, the first message that I, that I wanted to, to send. Then with respect to the question of, uh, as you put it, can, can we do this more cheaply? I, I definitely believe that we will see a geographically quite diversified portfolio, right? I mean, we won't see uh, um, the UK filling its 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 quota just by forcing everything. <laughs> for example, um, we would see a restoration as as a um, as an option that might actually also have um, a lot of uh, positive side effects. Um, for instance, in the in the tropics. Um, where, where, where it's also quite effective. But I think um, also for, um, for other countries, it makes sense to, to go forth. And um, I mean, my country, Germany, as a, as a technology nation, you would have expected that they've gone further uh, already uh, on, on, on CCS and maybe also direct air carbon capture and storage. But then, um, as we discussed uh, in the introduction, uh, there are other factors uh, that we have to think um, that we have to incorporate in our th thinking and, and, and public acceptance and legislation and all these things are, are part of that. So it, it would also be naive to, to uh, sort of uh, leave, leave those things out when you think about these uh, uh, such a national strategy. But we're seeing other countries that are making more progress uh, along these lines and um, uh, that will then uh, move move forth with uh, with with these kind of of um, um, uh, strategies. So I think cost is only one really element that that we see as we move forth. And I think one important thing that I also want to stress, and that is sometimes I think often misunderstood, is that um, it's 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 the the 1.5 degree target itself is also a societal choice right it's something that was discussed and where we decide okay incremental damages look like something that we don't want to accept um especially because some nations are going to be really badly affected and so on and um and then there are certain costs that come along with this and all we can do is map out different ways how to how to get there and some of them will be more costly and if some things are are unacceptable unacceptable to us then we 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 have to we we have to give way in in, in other dimensions so i think i mean 1.5 degrees if we don't need it, it it's not like the world is, is going to explode but if we as a society as a global society decide this is something that we want to to get around that then we we also sort of uh, making a commitment to bear the costs of of, of reaching that um, and and there are also pathways with very different costs so there are more things coming in now in the chat should should i monitor this and john i think you're on me oh, sorry uh, we'll take it, take it with what they come. So, so Todd, do you want to ask a question? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so, in your introduction, you uh, presented a number of different uh, CDR uh, pathways, and uh, I understand the the focus on BEX, but uh, there are other options like uh, mineralization which might be able to avoid some of the uh, conflicts that, that uh, could limit BEX. Have you yes. assessed uh, mineralization in as much detail as, as your BEX work? Uh, 
Yes, so um, I, the, the reason why I was focusing very much on backs and ducks here is be, because this is the CCS <laughs> webinar series. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I figured this was of most interest uh, to people. But I, sure. I on purpose flagged uh, this, this graphic where, where we actually showed all the different um, uh, options that we that we uh, surveyed, and um, and uh, and I also briefly said that that for instance enhancing natural natural uh, weathering processes is definitely one of the more promising uh, ones when it comes uh, also to solving this land use competition um, area. Actually, it might even have positive side effects in the mm. sense of that yeah. some of the literature found even fertilizing effects. Now, mm. um, one of uh, uh, I, I, I totally admit that we, uh, in the assessment, we were not very detailed in the IPCC report, and there's re other assessments that have done a better job there, uh, like the NAS um, assessment. But um, I think um, it, it's, it might definitely be part of a portfolio. When I, um, when I was discussing this with, um, uh, with, with people uh, before and also as part of the assessment, um, a concern that was often voiced was also uh, the, uh, yeah, you were talking about olivine, but it could also be basalt or, or whatever, but then actually you would have to have a lot of this, right? And then concerns were voiced with respect to, oh, do we then get rid of coal in order to have another mining industry? What about the energy um, to, to grind all the, uh, the minerals and so on? I think after the report, um, and after the assessment, there has been some progress also looking into these bottlenecks. Um, there's been this um, a recent uh, paper also by, by Berling, and actually a UK paper, really, that was uh, looking into what could you do actually with, uh, with waste from industry, with waste products. I think these are really the win-win um, entry points that we have to look for if we want to make such a portfolio work. So I said before, geographic diversification, but also diversification for sure across technologies and practices. That's a very good comment. Thanks for that. Thank you. So, uh, Sean, if, excuse me, if that's how you say it. Um. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a fairly short one. Thank you. It was a really, really interesting um, talk that you gave. Thank you, Saban. Um, I, I use this as just a, as a proxy to say that how would we, how would you go about trying to sell CCS to the world, as it were? I'd use COP26 as a proxy for the world. You know, how can we get them all to put it on their national declared contributions, for example? I think the most, the most powerful way to do that is really to show the kind of time scale that I hope I could, could bring across. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to, to imagine how, how we could uh, um, decarbonize industry so quickly without like with, with by, by striking CCF as off our, our agenda. So I think this is, this is definitely a, uh, one thing and then the other um, part is of course that it plays a vital role in in, in many of the pathways um, to uh, to remove co2 so um, I was here uh, focusing on on, on backs and ducks and that comes on top of the the decarbonization of fossil uh, co2 um, that comes in industry I think the closing time window is is really um, what uh, what one should should highlight here, and um, I think the other thing would uh, really be to have a more, yeah, to have a to have a broader perspective on this. So I think if you uh, come with a selling uh, strategy that uh, that only focuses on the technology and how great it is, and that we know how to do this, and even the storage is is solved because we. We, we, we will put it all <laughs> um, in, into the Northern Lights project or, or at Scotland, in Scotland, they're actually also, I think, investing in overcapacities. I think that's not, not, not a winning strategy. I think um, a winning strategy would be one where we actually acknowledge, okay, people have had issues with this um, because of X, Y, and Z, and, and, and let's have 
let's have a discourse on this. Let's see how this could work, work, work out, how this could look like, and then um, we, can, we can see how far, how far we get um, on this. But interestingly, um, I, I was invited to, to do a commentary that they did at One um, Earth uh, for a sort of special feature that they had sort of looking forth to COP26 and sort of highlighting what should be put on the agenda. And that's exactly actually what I, what I did. I actually pulled those two, two graphics from there, the, the one where we really drastically go down and CCS is of course a huge part of this uh, pathway and the other one where we have a little bit more flexibility, but then CCS is also needed for the, for the, for the negative emissions part. Well, thank you for that. If I could just, uh, if you could uh, indulge me, um, how would you then get them to pay? So we're talking about selling it. So you convince them that we need to do it. Uh, how do you think that we would get them to pay? You mean, uh, Nathan? So, so this is something that I that I tried to um, that I tried to discuss a little bit in the in the in the Swedish context, where I was sort of trying to show, okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, for a for a CO two for a for a not too crazy CO two price, a lot of these things would already make sense. Mm -hmm. So I think carbon pricing would already be one thing, but probably what you're looking for is also is also investment into into the earlier innovation stages, right? Where while you're ramping up CCS, that that governments would also need to signal some commitment there. And I think oh, oh. that is important as well, because you, you cannot say, okay, now we, we, we sort of want those investments, but I don't give you as the, as the investor any, any, any security in terms of that this will pay off in the future. I think a, a strong commitment uh, from politi pol pol politicians is needed in, in that sense. Yeah, I was thinking more of the fact that you've got such disparate countries and consequently they have a different view ah, on this okay. from, from South of Africa to Indonesia to, to Europe for that matter. Exactly. And that, is, that was also a little bit hidden in, 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 the, in the Sweden part when I was just saying, okay, part of this is also, um, I mean, people realize that, that part of this will happen not within their own country. So I think uh, there needs to be also more consideration of how you can uh, support these developments uh, elsewhere. Because, I mean, other countries won't be typically the ones that will put um, the money on the table to, to ramp up such an, such an infrastructure. Uh, yeah, totally, totally agreed on that uh, point. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Hi Sabine, how are you? Um, Hi David. Good to see you. Um, so uh, we just had our, um, the I don't know if you saw it, but the, the UK Climate Assembly just came out with its uh, report uh, today. Um, and maybe not surprisingly, they say uh, renewables are good, um, but we don't particularly think we should use bi bioenergy. We don't particularly think we should use um, CCS. So I was wondering if you could say, you know, say something about that related to the previous question, but also yeah. th they like the idea of forests, but I do wonder if, if agriculture is particularly a big part of this that requires subsidy reform. And again, economists will always argue subsidy reform is good, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's proven always to be very difficult. Yes. Um, so this is also something that's pro that, that's not typically a UK problem, but it's also something that is uh, typically a very prominent topic uh, um, at the EU level. Uh, everybody has probably already heard the the, the fork to farm um, <clears throat> debates and so on. So yes, I mean if we look at how uh, we've actually gone about um, negotiating or discussing even about. Uh, uh, the reforms uh, or the, the various reforms of the cap common agricultural policy, uh, the cap, then um, I think everybody would agree with uh, what you're saying that this is uh, not uh, necessarily uh, the, the smaller challenge. Um, but another thing that I would like to say in the uh, context of what you've been saying is that everybody is um, a fan of, of, of natural climate solutions. Everybody likes trees, everybody likes forests. That's also something that I'm always confronted with in uh, discussions. But if you look at, um, I mean, 
we, we, we've looked also at scenarios and pathways where we would actually uh, try to do uh, most of the carbon removal just like that, <laughs> just with, with afforestation. And I mean, it shouldn't come as a surprise uh, that, that you would look at even larger um, land conversions in order to have uh, this. So if, if your concern is really food security and the availability of land, then I don't think that that just transforming all what you see in terms of facts in those scenarios that I've shown today into um, into into afforestation, I think that that cannot really be be the answer um, either. Um, and in addition, uh, this comes also, of course, uh, over as yeah, people always think okay, that's it's. It's nice. We'll, we'll plant a couple of trees, but that's typically not um, what you would uh, what, what you would see. These are really massive, massive uh, uh, efforts, and this is typically also not something that we see um, in line with uh, our understanding of big win-win strategies with uh, conserving biodiversity and so on. So, um, and and also we're we're, we're having effect that. Uh, locally as well, right? Depending on where you do it, you have an effect on the albedo, you have an effect also on, on local weather and so on. So it's it's not as easy as that, even though it always, it's in term, to use the language of, of Sean before, it's, it's an easier sell usually. <laughs> but um, I think uh, it's something that uh, will be part of a, of, a, of a bigger portfolio. And I sometimes think this distinction between natural climate solutions and everything that has to do with CCS kind of evolves a little bit into a, yeah, into categorizing things into two camps already, um, which I don't think is, is very productive. I, I don't think one thing can fall off the agenda while we're only focusing on one thing. I think there's definitely a lot of good to be done um, with natural climate solutions, it's readily there. We have experience with this. We can, we can do this. Um, it's another question how, how th this would really look like in reality if we look at actually quite high deforestation rates. I mean, look at countries like Brazil. Look at what ongoing climate change is doing to to existing forests. So. It's, it's not necessarily something that, that if you look more closely is, is so much less challenging than the other stuff. But maybe if we talk about what we started in the beginning of the discussion with John, really a portfolio um, across geographies and then with Sean, a portfolio across technologies, maybe bringing in your dimension now is also portfolio across time, right? Where you would, basically need to also uh, keep other things on track in order to have it available when you when you will need it. Thanks. Sorry okay, for thank the big you. monologue. <laughs> no, it's very helpful. Yeah. So, so Sabine, I mean, coming back to the economics, you said um, people want to have 1.5 degrees. Well, I mean, of course they do. But do you think that that actually the implications of that are known because you know at one level I look at it and I think well if if BEX or CDR is so necessary why do you have to sell it it ought to sell itself yeah that's uh, that's you trying to give an answer to to Sean's previous question right uh, in in principle if we if we don't want to accept the the damages so to say then we should be prepared uh, to to actually pay for it, and this is actually, I think, also the argument that 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 Miles was making in the in the spring series, right? If if that's our agreement, then basically each ton that we emit at some point in time um, should actually pay for it for its own removal. Um, it should basically raise the revenue for 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 being removed again, and. Um, that's that's uh, definitely one argument for net zero. It doesn't really solve where the money comes from when we go net negative, as we do in most of the pathways. But um, in in principle, it's it's not really an economic question. Then it's it's more more a question. But do you think you think that's being realised? I mean, it, it it seems a very simple concept, but 
I well, I think at to some point, uh, to some to some extent, this is this is being realized. Uh, people talking also in in terms of cost benefit frameworks, but um, I think in terms of the assessments and and all the language around this, this is typically something that we that we haven't seen stressed so much because it's scientifically also difficult to sort of weigh the damages against the costs, right? You quickly get into, okay, how much does this human life cost? <laughs> um, and how yes, much do we... Is, yeah, that's true. Maybe that's why we don't yeah, the cost put numbers of, on it. Weighing the cost of neutrality, in other words, what you said, removing the CO2. Subsequently, you know, we, we have some idea of that. So that's, you know, leaving, leaving aside the debate of I won't, I won't actually be neutral, I'll, I'll apply the load on someone else, which is always the cheapest. Yeah, but, um, what, the, but, but what the 1.5 degree report tried was to really show this sort of like incremental damage, right? The incremental costs, <clears throat> not necessarily quantified and monetized, but sort of saying, okay, two degrees, we still maybe have some corals, 1.5 degrees, everything got, <laughs> so to say. Yeah. Sort of giving a basis for, for the kind of discussion that you're implying. Well, I guess what you're saying there is that, that effectively, there's still not a commitment to really to net zero, let alone net negative. In other words, if it looks too difficult, people will just give up. Yeah, actually, when I was invited to, to uh, participate in the 1.5 degree report, that was actually even an open question for me. I, because it was the first report I was really invited for, um, I had the feeling it was a little bit like, oh, now we, we sort of agreed that we would do 1.5, like well below two degrees and uh, with a perspective to, to do even do uh, 1.5 degrees. Can we even do it? And can we even afford to do it? And, and, and would it be so much worse to, 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 to be in a two degree world? And, um, and I think that that comes as, as part of a rela realization of, of what, what you were sort of alluding to. Um, indeed, yeah. And then for an economist, I, I guess you, you raised a question which has always interested me as a simple engineer. Um, you say, you know, we could work out the cost of the damage economic cost of damage and, and make that equation. But then, then the theory goes that I'll charge somebody that economic cost for emitting the CO2. But so I charge them, how do I actually put the damage right with that money? I mean, is there, is there any sort of equation to that? You know, you know, in other words, it's the damage still happens, the money gets charged. Um, how does it all, you know, how does it work out? Because if people if people think they're going to have more fun emitting the CO2 and paying the money, then they'll emit it and then the damage will happen. And you know, well, for, else. first of all, I don't think it's so easy to work out uh, the, 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 the money question to, to really sort of monetize all the damage. And, and a lot of people would uh, rightly say that, that some stuff cannot even be valued in, 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 in economic terms and it should be preserved in any case. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, so that's already one thing why I think uh, we, we don't ha really have that discussion. And, and, and the other thing is that, that we've seen a lot of uh, this discussion. I mean, uh, who, how, basically how we should share the burden if we agree that certain things too are, to, are to be avoided. And this has been done for, for sort of like sharing emissions quotas. But I think that's probably something that we're also going to, going to see more in the future, right? If we have to remove so and so much CO2, who should be bearing the, the cost for this? Is it, is it those countries that, that have a lot of potential, that have been responsible for, as you put it, for the party that was being had ex ante? Or is it actually uh, people that are, uh, countries that are richer? Um, and so on. And, and there's already some literature emerging around this, and there's also some literature already on this, but I mean, it's of course far from, uh, from being, being solved, and, um, and that doesn't, of course, give you a mechanism where you could also enforce these kind of things. No, 
I mean, all these pathways I've been showing you, they have a global carbon price, yeah? I mean, how, how, how would that look like enforcing a global, global carbon price? Um, that's, that's something where we're still sort of far, far off. Well, you said we're far off. So the, 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 I guess the sort of final question I, I would ask you is, if you were to come and give this lecture in, in five years' time, which we've already put in our diary, of course, um, <laughs> how different do you think it would be? And then I guess I'd only go as far again as 10 years ahead, bearing in mind the likely emissions over those cumulative emissions over those five and 10 years. Now, how much do you think the debate is, well, is likely to change? Bearing in mind that I think it's changed noticeably, as you said, over the last five years. Well, I, think, I, mean, um, I think I got those times right, but it, and how do you think it'll change, I guess? Is the, is yeah, the so maybe, uh, actually, I, I have spoken in a, in a previous UK uh, CCRS uh, uh, web, uh, web, um, actually not webinar series, I was even there <laughs> physically uh, and that was uh, in 2016 so if you put me in your diary from for, for five years from now that's actually a, a quite nice uh, progression and i looked actually at what i've been saying there and it was uh, very technology focused and oh maybe that's something we need to look into so you already see quite a progression and a change of debate already now and i think we'll see more movement into this direction because what I realized also now in these post-corona discussions and so on around uh, recovery packages and so on is that compared to previous crises, economic crises, we see that climate change has entered the mainstream much more. I mean, people would have liked to see more concrete measures, uh, more concrete roadmaps for, for implementing something and so on. But climate change at least features now in all of those, those texts and quite heavily so, and there's a debate around this. It's, it's entered a uh, definite debate more also through um, uh, what young people have, have, have pushed forth in 2019, for instance, and um, industry also has it firmly on their radar. There's more companies, industries, sectors really looking into um, their own sort of like uh, uh, net, net, net zero roadmaps. So I think, um, we're, we're on a track where we, where we sort of uh, have, have a much bigger openness um, towards this and that will shape um, how, how it will look like. I think I'm not that optimistic that I, that I, that I say in five years we'll, we'll, we have seen this complete turnaround and, and all these technologies are already being in the process of being ramped up, but what I at least hope we will see is that we have a much broader lens um, uh, through which we look at these things and that we that we that we um, sort of achieve uh, a debate at also more granular level seeing how this can be taken forth towards the next step so I hope in five years I won't have to show any global pathways and I can show a lot more of how uh, things could look like um, on the ground. But how much do you think that the, uh, well, the, the, the cumulative emissions over that period and the, and the warming that's then locked in and the, the reduction in the range of different options to achieve 1.5 degrees, how much do you think that's entering into the debate? Because you know, this is just going on steadily in the background, it's happening. The climate well, I, I, I hope that I hope that won't we that I, I hope very much that we won't see a lot of ex ante reductions in, in in options, and that we that that we will still keep uh, the discussion flowing on on a lot of options that we will need for a for a proper portfolio, um, not only over options but as we said as a result of this discussion also across geographies and also across time, um, but um, I. Uh, can, can you? So that was the second part of your question. Can you repeat the first part again? Well, I guess it's I guess it's really a, you know an influence on the on the on the public debate. It's it's just that you can credibly show scenarios which still get to one point five degrees by you know, incredible amounts yeah. of reduction, but pretty soon 
there will be no amount of reduction that will get you to 1.5 degrees. I guess, exactly. I guess, so, I guess and, and I, true, so within maybe five years. And I think that 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 will increasingly be helpful actually to to get like I mean because 2019 we've seen really big impacts already here in terms of a heat summer, a lot of heat stress and so on. I think that will help to keep things um, on 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 the table. And then yeah, if. I mean, 1.5 degrees is really enormously challenging. I hope I could really bring that across. But I mean, it's it's also not like, as I said, right, before we had a two degree target. And if we can sort of uh, come to a realization that we need to keep all options on the table and work something out that makes this this work, then even even overshooting that a, that a bit might have helped us to, to sort of, um, uh, get things going, going on the ground, and and you see these things. I mean, even in Germany, they were mentioning CCS again last year. Uh, year. So it's sort of entering back <laughs> uh, the agenda. And also, if I was completely pessimistic, I couldn't go to work in the morning. So you have to leave me a little bit. Of <laughs> Don't worry, but yes, okay, very good. That this will that this will not fall off the agenda. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, we'll. we'll uh, We'll have it recorded. So when we get you back in uh, in four or five years' time, yes, that's also what changes every five years. Now you'll get recorded and pinned down on everything. Yes. That you said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot for yeah, having well, me. It was a very moment. nice discussion, actually. And and you particularly appreciated your graphics. They were really very very insightful. Good choices. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll share uh, slides with uh, with Caris and Victoria afterwards to uh, make them available okay. to participants. Thank you very much. And Caris, do you want to say anything about uh, what's happening next? Um, yeah, I can do. So first of all, thank you, Sabine, as well. Um, yeah, that was really interesting and a really interesting discussion afterwards. So thank you for joining us today. Um, so next week, so we've moved now to a um, weekly schedule of lectures. Um, so next Thursday at the same time at um, three o'clock, we'll be hearing from Dr. Richard Porter and Professor Haroon Magarefta from University College London. Um, and Richard will be presenting on his latest work on optimizing methanol production from steel manufacture of gases. Um, so it'll be a deep dive into a very research focused um, lecture next week. Um, but yeah, thank you for joining us today, everyone. And thank you again, Sabine. That was great. Thank you for letting me opening this. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye.